Hi, I'm Dr. Jessica Labonte and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Viral Ecology Lab. Uh, but first I'll tell you about the courses that I teach. I teach in the fall by uh, Fundamentals of Microbiology, Biology 351. And for this course, all you need is your chemistries and uh, your biology courses. And chemistry is very important. You may not think right now that, uh, that it's that important, but chemistry, microbiology, it's like peanut butter and jelly. They really go well together. So that's why you have to take your chemistry before you take microbiology. Uh, the second course that I teach is Applied Bioinformatics, MARB 4333. And for this course, uh, we're basically learning how to use computers to do biology. So we learn how to do phylogen uh, phylogenetics, analyze genomes, how sequencing works, and uh, we also end up with a project where everybody gets to actually uh, do their own bioinformatics project and analyze their DNA sequences. Uh, in my lab, the Viral Ecology Lab, we care a lot about viruses. And maybe right now you're like, hmm, viruses, why should I care? Well, let's say you go to the beach and you're swimming. And I know I like to ask my, myself questions about my surroundings. I don't know if you ever asked yourselves how many viruses are in one mil of seawater. But in coastal areas, just like here in Galveston, there can be up to 10 million viruses in one milliliter of seawater. So they're extremely abundant. But obviously, they're not infecting us. They're infecting bacteria, phytoplankton, algae, all the other microscopic or microorganisms that are living in, in the water. And there's, so there's 10 million viruses, there's about a million bacteria, and a larger phytoplankton are about 10 times less. So all of these are very abundant and they are interacting with each other. And what we study in the lab is, is what are the role of viruses in the ocean? So one, one of the major role that they play is population control. So sometimes there's algae blooms and the way they're terminated is usually uh, by viruses because you have a bloom of, of that one algae, so you get some millions of, of clones, millions of twins of that algae. So when you have one that's going to die, it's going to release 10 viruses. That's going to infect the next one, release 10 viruses, and that's how algae blooms usually get terminated. Viruses, they're extremely diverse. So you could pick viruses, you could pick millions of viruses and never find the same one again. So because they're so diverse and they infect their host, they're hijacking their host. Sometimes they are also a little sloppy, leave DNA behind, bring DNA that's not there. So they are involved in horizontal gene transfer and evolution and adaptation of their host. And that's another thing that we do, uh, do study in the lab. And finally, viruses, they're also very important to uh, release carbon and they're very important in the whole geochemical cycles. Every time a cell dies, it will burst, which will release its inside. That's food for the other microbes. So they're very good at recycling nutrients and that's why they're so important. And without viruses, we would actually not even exist. So all, all that, we know these main facts, but the nitty gritty details we don't know so much, and that's what we study here in the Barrel Ecology Lab. Uh, I'm Kate Campbell. I'm a PhD student here in the Levante Lab. Um, my current project uh, surrounds samples from uh, an underwater volcano. Um, they're subsurface samples, so they're a bunch of hard rock sediment, uh, cores, essentially. And my project surrounds um, trying to extract DNA from them, as well as culturing them for different um, metabolisms. Uh, specifically isolating, hopefully, fingers crossed, sulfur uh, metabolizers. Um, and I also have samples from the East Pacific Rise, which is a spreading ridge. Um, I have mostly uh, viral samples from them, uh, looking at the different ways that uh, viruses compete and uh, also have mutualistic relationships with their uh, hosts in different environments within the spreading ridge. 
So you said you're taking samples from rocks. Mm -hmm. How do you extract the viruses from rock sediments, uh, rock material? Um, so it was a little complicated. It took me almost two years uh, to actually um, troubleshoot the extraction because it's not only difficult, but because of the mineralization of the rocks, as in they're positively charged and DNA is negatively charged. So even if there was DNA in there, it would bind to the rocks, um, which I, I proved with additional samples that we had that were that I could play around with. Um, but essentially, you just you have to do. It's low biomass too. So it's not, it's really difficult to tell that you even got any DNA out. Uh, we're about to send them off for sequencing, but um, it's just a phenol chloroform extraction. Um, basically you do an organic extraction um, of the rocks where the DNA eventually gets washed into the aqueous phase. Um, and then you ethanol precipitate that. Um, okay. And then that's pretty much it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jordan Walker. I'm a PhD student at the Viral Ecology Lab here on campus at Texas A&M University, Galveston. I'm currently studying um, microbes in coastal environments, specifically viruses and how they interact with their host, um, being bacteria, um, small eukaryotes like phytoplankton, or uh, even larger organisms like oysters. Uh, my particular focus right now is on how Hurricane Harvey has been affecting, how Hurricane Harvey affected Galveston Bay, washed some of those microbes out of the bay and new ones were replaced with them, and how those viruses were interacting with them during that time. I'm also looking at a phytoplankton bloom in Corpus Christi. Um, we're characterizing the viral communities there and what's infecting what there. So are they infecting the bacteria within that bloom or are they infecting the phytoplankton within that bloom? And then a third project I'm working on is to look at wetlands that have been restored in Galveston and compare them to uh, original wetlands and see what the difference in microbial communities is and if we can use that as an indicator of how well restoration efforts have gone. Uh, so my favorite uh, marine sea creature is a uh, Pelagibacter. It was formerly known as SAR-11 and it's the most abundant bacteria in the ocean, especially in oligotrophic waters or the open ocean. Um, it's my favorite because it was one of the first genomes that I put together from my Hurricane Harvey project and got to really look at it in depth of how it changed over the course of that time period. Um, as far as advice goes for students, um, I would strongly advise going into labs and getting new experiences, especially learning new skills. Um, the first thing that I did was I looked for a lab where I could learn a skill that would be applicable to a wide variety of topics, um, and genomics was one of those. Um, biology is getting more and more analytical and those are skills that can be applied to many different careers so I would highly recommend you know going into different labs and getting new skills. So these are virus concentrates. This one is still on a filter and we'll be putting some buffer in it later to get the extract of the viral concentrates. So what this is is it's two liters of water that we filtered out everything but viruses and then we added iron chloride to it to attach to the viruses so that we could filter them out on a larger pore size. And then, so we end up with two liters worth of viruses here in 15 milliliters of water. For after my PhD, I'm still kind of thinking about what I want to do, but academia has always been on the top of my list and going in, looking at coral reefs and deep sea biology and how microbes and virus are acting in those different um, environments. Coastal has become more and more uh, of a topic that I'm loving as I'm learning more about the science um, and I can definitely see my career going that way, but I'm still trying to decide.